Nathan, thank you very much for a great selection of songs that has focused our minds so well already on our Lord. I enjoyed your Bible class too. I profited greatly from our study of Romans chapter 11. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Luke the 22nd chapter and we'll be there in just a moment. Luke chapter 22. Susan and I cannot adequately adequately express the indescribable joy that it gives us to be here at Gardendale. You have always been in our hearts and more recently have especially been in our hearts as we have cried with you in the loss of loved ones. Most recently, uh, Jim Knoll. Jim was my friend. He always did me all good and no harm. And he will be among the many reasons why I will make it to heaven one day, and I'm thankful for that. I'm humbled to be able to be here. I give God all the praise for all the good that He does in our lives. And really, as I thought about what we're going to do this week, it occurred to me that I've really got somewhat of a theme going here, although somewhat unintended. If at the end of this meeting you can say that I have come to love the Lord more, I so much want to be like the Lord, and I oh so much want to be with the Lord when this life is over. I hope that you can say that those three things have grown in your heart at the end of this meeting. It's good to have Susan with me. Henderson is also able to be here today along with my good friend David, and I'm so thankful uh, for them being able to be here. Good to see everybody who is here this morning. When I was growing up, As a little boy, one of the things that always fascinated me was seeing my mom and my aunt talk. And you might say, well, what was fascinating about that? Well, my aunt was deaf and mute. And so the means of communication that they had between each other was sign language. And it always amazed me. Sign language is so beautiful and so picturesque at times. Do you know what the universal sign is for Jesus? It's this. Nail prints in His hands. And it kind of amazes me that in choosing one sign that represents our Lord, it's the scars in His hands. If you wanted to say... Jesus loves you, it would be a bit more. It would be Jesus loves you. And as I think about the beauty of that, I'm made to think so much about the beauty of our Lord. Even today, His scars are still speaking of His love for us. And there is a beautiful story that is told in every single one of His scars, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. The first point that I would like to share with you this morning is to help us to understand... Is this on? (laughs) Is to help us to understand that His pains were very much in His body. His scars were painful. In fact, you began to see it very early, even in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke, the 22nd chapter and verse 44, it says in the Garden of Gethsemane that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. There Luke is a physician describing that moment as Jesus is under such incredible stress that his sweat becomes like great drops of blood falling to the ground. I don't know what's happening there, but there are medical doctors who speak today of a situation that is called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis sometimes happens when a person is under enough stress levels that the blood will actually secrete into the sweat glands, and what comes out of the person is a bloody sweat. 
I don't know if that's what's happening. I take Luke at, with what he says. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. I'm wanting you to understand that he is suffering already in the Garden of Gethsemane. But there was going to be some terribly scarring moments that would be in the next little while. First of all, I want us to understand that Jesus was scarred on three levels. He was scarred physically, He was scarred emotionally, and I believe that He suffered even a spiritual scarring. When the Bible talks about crucifixion, the understanding is that the early readers would have known exactly what that was all about. We always don't know about that and what that's really about. And so I want us to spend just a little bit of time here trying to help us understand what's involved in all of this. Before Jesus ever went to the cross, the Bible says that Jesus was scourged. What they would do is they would take a man, wrap his arms around a beam or perhaps even a large rock until they have got his back as tight as a drum. And when they have gotten him there, Roman lictors who are on each side of him will alternate back and forth and back and forth and back and forth upon his back. The Jews had limits. The Romans didn't. Their intention was to bring a man as close to death as they could bring him and then back off. The blood loss at, cruc at scourging was absolutely Incredible. Daniel Webster uh, talks about this moment and he says this, the tension of awaiting that first blow was cruel. And then it came. And then it came. And then it came. And it came. After what seemed like an eternity to the victim and those who loved him, his limp body was finally cut away from the post. And thus, by modern day criteria, if at the time, at that time, Jesus had been admitted to a hospital, he would have been put into intensive or critical care. That's just the scourging. I am told by those who have studied such that they say it was so bad at times that sometimes a person's intestines might even come out. There's just that much brutality that's brought to the body. Not just the skin, but we're talking about shreds of muscle. He's a mangled mess when they get through with the scourging. The Bible simply says that they pierced his hands and his feet. Those who have researched this have said that more than likely they put a nail in this part of his hand. If you feel of your hand and your wrist, it's okay to do it. You'll feel that there is a bone on this side. There is a bone on the other side. And right here is the wrist. And there is no way that that's going to rip through. But right there, if that's the spot where they put the nail, there is a median nerve that goes up into your hands. And those who have had hand surgery will tell you of all surgeries they have had, it's one of the most painful. You think about the sensitivity of our hands and what we can feel, just the slightest things we can feel. This causes racketing pain in the body. Because what Jesus has to do on the cross to exhale is He has to push up with His feet and He has to pull with His arms. And with that, this nerve is scraping on the metal. Pain is intense. The Romans had, had studied this and they have got pain level maxed out in this kind of torture. In fact, there is a word that we use sometimes. I, I've gotten to where I won't use it because it seems almost dishonoring to use it. But sometimes we'll say, oh, the pain was excruciating. But what we don't realize is that very word references the cross. It means like something out of the cross. And I'm not sure I've ever suffered any pain like that out of the cross. X means out of cruci, crucifixion, like something out of the cross. His hands and his feet, there's an ankle bone that has been dug up of more than likely a crucifixion victim. 
As you know, they put a crown of thorns on his head. And then in John 19, the Bible says that they came to the cross. In John 19, we begin reading now in verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The idea here is you're going to take a huge mallet and you're going to swing this mallet into the legs of the crucifixion victim and break his legs so that he can no longer lift up and he cannot exhale and he will die as a result of the breaking of his bones. Verse 32 says, The soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. I like what Marshall Keeble once said. He said, there's been blood in the water ever since. (laughs) Blood and water comes out. And he who has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth that you may believe. For these things were done that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another Scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. And so they go into the side of Jesus, and medical doctors say that what they're doing is they're aiming for the heart. And they go in and they rupture the heart and blood and water comes out. And medical doctors have said that the presence of blood and water is a good indication that Jesus, quite possibly of other things, died of a broken heart. In every sense of the word, he died truly of a broken heart. When I was at Gardendale in the time that I was here, it's hard to believe that that's been, uh, that's been over 20 years since I was here. But during that time, there was a film that came out called The Passion of the Christ. And I decided to go see it because I thought that there might be opportunity to talk to people because everybody's talking about it. And I thought it might be a springboard to talk. But I remember when I went to see that thing, they showed the scourging scene or they depicted the the scourging scene. And you know how it is sometimes a movie just pulls you in? I mean, you just feel like you're just right there. Well, that scourging went on and on and on to the point that somebody in the theater said, Stop it! And that's the way you felt. Stop it! You know how it is after a movie. Normally you come on out and you're lolly and you're bouncing around and you've had your popcorn and you've had your Coke and you've had all that stuff. Let me tell you, nobody was talking coming out of that theater. I got in my car and the truth is I came right here to this building and I sat right there on that pew and I said, God... Help me to never do anything to hurt the cause of my Lord. And I've told people several times, yeah, I saw it, but I don't want to watch it again. And to this day, I have not. It was just that awful. Isaiah 52 and verse 14 is unfortunately not read when we read Isaiah 53, but Isaiah 52 and verse 14 says that his visage was marred more than any man. Which means that Jesus, when they got through with him, is almost unrecognizable. That's the mess that they have made of him. What I'm telling you is that Jesus suffered scars physically. But I also want us to understand that Jesus suffered emotional scars. Turn to Matthew 27. In Matthew 27, beginning in verse 27. Matthew 27 and verse 27. Think about the emotional effect this would have on him. Verse 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Yeah, a king needs a needs a robe. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, 
He needs a crown, and so for that, a crown of thorns. They put the crown on his head. Oh, he needs a scepter. They give him a reed, a stick, and they put it in his right hand. And then they bow the knee, and they mock him and say, Hail, King of the Jews. (laughs) He needs an anointing. What can we do for that? Oh, some spit. They spat on him. And then it says they struck him on the head, and remember the crown of thorns is already there. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now verse 38. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by wagged their heads and said, You you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Christ, the Son of God, come down from the cross. And likewise, the chief priest, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. By the way, no greater truth was ever spoken. If he saves himself, nobody else can be saved. But here they are saying, If you're the Christ, come down from the cross. I remember Paul Earnhardt saying one time, He could have annihilated the whole world and been done before supper. And yet he hangs there and suffers all of this. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he'll have him. Don't you know that hurt? If he'll have him? For he said, I am the son of God. And even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. I tell you what, whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me did not know what he was talking about. Psalm 22 and verse 7 in a beautiful prophetic uh, psalm about the crucifixion of Jesus says in Psalm 22 and verse 7 that they, that they shot out the lip. They shoot out the lip. Verbal bullets. It's like they're saying we have maimed his body and now let's crush his spirit. Scars emotionally. And I believe scars spiritually. Matthew 27, verse 45 and 46 says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why? Hast thou forsaken me? And I will just say that there has been a lot of preacher talk as to whether Jesus actually suffered God forsakenness on the cross. I'll just tell you my belief still is yes. I may not can wrap my head around all that. I may not can describe that fully. But I believe the words are meant to portray what they say. Why hast thou forsaken me? He's hurt in his spirit. There is spiritual stuff going on at the cross. His scars were painful. But I also want us to know, I didn't advance my slides, did I? I also want us to know that his scars were necessary. Let's return to the words in the garden. In Matthew 26, verse 38 and 39. It's good to hear those pages turning. I remember one time being in a service and the pages were turning like that and a little girl turned to her mama and said, Mama, listen, that's beautiful. (laughs) Verse 38, he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now, let's, let's break that down. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. I think he's saying, I feel already like I'm going to die. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus sees the cross as a cup. 
I personally believe that if we think about the Old Testament, when the Bible talks a lot about a cup, it's the cup of God's wrath that is given to someone to drink. I believe Jesus suffers the wrath that we deserve. And we furthermore see in verse 42 that he went away again a second time and prayed, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. The old timers used to say that he drank it down to its bitter dregs. Jesus took no edge off of the cross. Hebrews 5 and verse 7 would say that in the time of His flesh, that He with vehement cries and tears cried out to God. You ever cried so hard you shook? You ever cried so hard your whole body was shaking? Vehement cries and tears. I want to draw your attention to the fact that Jesus said, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. If it's possible. Did it pass? And what tells me, what that tells me, is that it was not possible that that cup could pass and me be saved. His scars were necessary. They were necessary for our salvation. In Hebrews 9 and verse 22, we're told very simply in the Hebrew letter, Hebrews 9 and verse 22, according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. His scars are necessary. I think about Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 when it says, Let it be known to you that there is no other name, no other name given under heaven whereby we may be saved. The emphasis here is His scars were necessary. There's no other that can do this. When I was here at Gardendale, I know I used this illustration, but y'all got a lot of new people, so maybe I can tell it again. But I used to use this illustration about how that... um, You know, suppose before I went to this gospel meeting, I went down to the department store here in Gardendale and I bought me this shirt. And I get up here and like I do and like Jason and Andrew do, you know, you get a little going and you get a little warm and you get a little hot around the neck sometimes and there's a ring around the collar. But afterward, I think, Jeff May, you have just preached about righteousness and you preached in a stolen shirt. You stole the shirt. So I steal this shirt and I preach in it and I feel guilty. And I try to take the thing back and I go to the department store and I try to give the shirt back and he says, that's not the shirt you stole. Well, yeah, it is. Look right. Got your name. Got the name right there. That's it. You got some right here just like it. No, no, no. That's not the shirt you stole. The shirt you stole was a perfect shirt wrapped up, pinned and everything else. It was perfect. And you're trying to bring back one that's all soiled like this one? No, sir. You want to pay me back, you give me a perfect one. Now here's my question. Who's going to do that? When you sin the first time, you stole a perfect relationship with God. Who's going to give it back? Alan, will you give it? Alan's got the same problem I got. Rusty, will you do it? He's got the same problem I've got. Every one of you have the same problem I've got. We're all dirty shirts. There's only one person who could give back to God what was taken. And that's the perfect, sinless Son of God, His scars were necessary. They were necessary for me to know that He understands my scars. We all have them, don't we? All the scars that we have tell stories. Some of those stories we wish we could forget. And some of those stories that the scars tell, we don't need to forget. It may be that you've got one on your body that was caused by an accident. You may look at that scar and realize that could have been so much worse. And so the scar speaks of how fortunate you really were in that moment. 
You may have one that has come about as a result of a surgery. Perhaps, I don't know, I've never asked a woman, she may look at the scar that was left from a C-section and actually smile because of what that scar represents. But it might be a scar that's come by disease uh, that has ravaged the body. There are some who have scars that are there because they were physically abused. And then there are some who have scars that you don't see on the outside, but they're on the inside. Something emotional and traumatic that trigger bad memories. I've got a preacher friend who said that his wife suffered terrible things along the way, and he said every once in a while the cabinet doors will open, meaning here it all comes. Emotional trauma. Scars on the soul. Jesus had that. Sometimes your own brethren can hurt you. He said of Judas, he's my own familiar friend in whom I trusted. He's lifted up his heel against me. In the garden, he says to Judas, friend, why have you come? I remember reading one time of a lady who wrote an article and she said, never in my wildest imaginations did I ever imagine that my brethren would terrorize me. Your friends can hurt you. And somehow that seems the worst of the hurt. There may be a wound that you have because you've lost a loved one. Somebody very close to you. And there's the wounds that we have that have been caused by my own sin. Scars. But what the Bible says is that Jesus knows. And Jesus cares. In Hebrews 2, verse 17 and 18, Jesus put skin on. <laughs> so that He could identify with you. And if you've got scars, He would say, I, I know, I know. Verse 17, Therefore in all things He had to be made like His brethren, that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for that in He Himself has suffered being tempted, He's able to aid those who are tempted. And verse 15 of chapter 4 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can never say to Jesus, you don't understand. Because He would say, oh, yes, I do. So His scars were necessary. His scars were painful, and they helped me to know that He understands my scars, and He knows your scars. Then this, His scars provide evidence. One of the most interesting things about the resurrection of Jesus, when He's resurrected from the dead, is that the scars are still there. And that's a bit surprising but those scars are there providing evidence that the one who stands in front of you is the same one who died for you. Look at the hands. Look at the feet. Look at the side. It is so troubling that the disciples did not believe. Thomas said, Thou will not believe without evidence. And somebody once said, That's unfortunate for Thomas but it's very fortunate for us. Because what we learn from that is these men were not gullible. Do you realize there's people who say that all these apostles, they were all wrapped up in Jesus and they wanted to believe all this stuff about Jesus and they just believe anything. They were gullible men. Not Thomas. I will not believe. Unless I see the evidence. And the beautiful thing is He gave them what they needed. And let me just quickly say that that's one thing beautiful about Jesus. He'll always give you what you need. John the Baptist, in prison, discouraged. The very one who said, Behold, the Lamb of God, later says, 
Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus understood that sometimes that when we get in situations, it can create doubt. And He just said, go tell Thomas. Excuse me, go tell John. Tell him that the blind are seeing, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf are hearing, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And I think the idea is immediately John's mind would go, whoop, back to Isaiah, he's the one. Why did I ever, why did I let my discouragement let me think otherwise? And even in John 20, verse 24, in John 20 and verse 24, here's Thomas. Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I can see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. He said to Thomas, Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, Thomas, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. The other remarkable thing is to see that Jesus is pictured arriving in heaven as a scarred lamb. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, John is weeping because he wants to know the future and what's going to happen in the midst of all this persecution. Verse 4, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, catch it, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Jesus is pictured arriving there as a lamb as though it had been slain. Verse 9, they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll, open its seals, for you were slain, and you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign upon the earth. And verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain, lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Listen to me. 28 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is pictured as the Lamb. The Lamb. God is ever keeping it in front of us. There's the Lamb. And the scars provide the evidence. And then His scars give courage and motivation. Can I make quick order of this one for the sake of time? You know as well as I do that the, dis the disciples were huddled up in fear, but then they saw Jesus. They had all scattered, but then they saw Jesus. And after they saw Him alive, and after they saw the scars, it filled them with courage because here was proof that Jesus can overcome anything. Jesus can overcome death. We can overcome death. The grave could not hold Him. The Master is alive. And in Acts 2, He told them that the one that you took, who by many infallible proofs proved that He was the Son of God, you took Him and with wicked hands you crucified and put Him to death, but God raised Him up. And He later tells them that you have crucified the Messiah and He's on the throne. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The thing I'm wanting to stress to you is after Peter saw those scars, he stood there tooth and nail with them. No fear. Had courage in everything that he did. Acts chapter 5, before Gamaliel, they took that beating that Gamaliel recommended. 
And it says that they went out from that council rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer shame for His name. He had His scars and they were more than happy to take their own. They had courage. Acts 14, verse 19 and 20, Paul is stoned. He gets up, probably by the help of God. But you take huge rocks and you throw it down upon a man. It's not hard to imagine Paul scarred. In Galatians chapter 6, here's the real proof passage. Galatians 6, I would ask you to turn there. In Galatians chapter 6, I want you to see verse 14 and then verse 17. God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks, the marks of the Lord Jesus. Paul has scars, marks of Jesus on his body. And we may too have to take on some physical persecution one day. And as I finish this point, I want to stress that there are other marks that you ought to already be taking on. I heard Sewell Hall present a wonderful sermon along these lines, and it's the idea of He died for us, we need to live for Him. He said, your Bibles need to be marked. Your Bibles need to have the marks of the Lord Jesus. One time a lady said to me, she saw my Bible, and she said, you write in your Bible? I said, you don't? I'm not saying you got to do that, but I just believe our Bibles need to have some... My mind has some wrinkles in it, some tears. I've been putting tape on it. It's got some marks. Your calendars. Did you mark your calendars for this week? Does this week have the marks of the Lord Jesus on it? Your checkbook ought to have some marks of the Lord Jesus. marks. And ultimately, His scars take away yours and mine. Isaiah 53, that wonderful text that we've read so many times. Isaiah 53 and verse 3, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Surely He's borne our griefs, He's carried our sorrows. We sang that We esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. By His stripes we are healed. My sin scars are gone. Ultimately, God will take that all away. Any emotional scars that I have had will be taken away. Any bodily scars that I may have will be taken away. Jesus in His hometown synagogue of Nazareth stood before them and said, I was sent to heal the brokenhearted. Revelation 21 talks about there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, the former things that have passed away. And listen, brethren, isn't this what we sing about the most when we sing about heaven? That He's going to take it all away. His scars will ultimately heal mine. My bodily scars will be no more. It goes into the ground. My body goes in corruptible. It comes up incorruptible. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. I come forth with a marvelous body. Redemption is about more than redeeming us from our sins. Redemption even includes the redemption of my body. If you are scarred today, Isn't this one of the greatest things ever? Every broken thing will be made whole. It's all made new. This sermon was inspired after a friend of mine 
had lost her sister. She shared with me some words from a song that are impressionable to me. Allow me some poetic liberty. I don't know if Jesus still has scars. I do believe that it is very much within the realm of possibility. Healed scars. I've got marks on my body. Besides scars, I've got marks that say something. It is within the realm of possibility that He will have marks that forever show us, there's the Lamb. And we finish here. If I had only known the last time would be the last time. I would have put off all the things I had to do. I would have stayed a little longer, held on a little tighter. Now what I'd give for one more day with you. Because there's a wound here in my heart where something's missing. And they tell me that it's going to heal with time. But I know you're in a place where all your wounds have been erased. And knowing yours are healed is healing mine. The only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken. And all will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile now, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. I know the road you walked was anything but easy. You picked up your share of scars along the way. Oh, but now you're standing in the sun. You've fought your fight and your race is run. The pain is all a million miles away. The only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken. and All the old will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile now, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. Hallelujah for the hands that hold you. There's not a day goes by that I don't see you. You live on and on in all the better parts of me. Until I'm standing with you in the sun, I'll fight this fight and this race I'll run until I finally see what you can see. Oh, the only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken and all the old will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile now, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. I know this. Jesus' scars will take away mine. And will take away yours. Hallelujah. I want you to understand that Jesus loves you. And as we come to the table this morning, let's be mindful of what our Lord has done. If you need to respond to the gospel this morning, come while we stand and as we sing.